Uh, very favorable, actually. The uh, floor data met its primary endpoint, which is progression-free survival, with a large increase over the standard of care, which is first-generation EGFR TKI. Um, and the progression-free survival of 18.9 months was consistent with previous uh, unrandomized data from the Aura program, so it's consistent, and so it's uh, replicable and reliable and believable. And the control arm performed just about as expected with about a 10.2 median progression-free survival. And the hazard ratio was 0.46 uh, overall, which is excellent with a good p-value. So we think this is a very robust result for progression-free survival, which is a clinically believable endpoint. And so uh, first-line impression of the efficacy is very favorable. In terms of the toxicity, which we can talk about a little bit later in detail, but uh, overall it seemed to be somewhat less toxic than standard of care. So it seems that we have a new drug here which is better from an efficacy point of view and better from a toxicity point of view. Uh, so I think it uh, represents uh, progress. I think the progression-free survival benefit is very substantial and is more than we would usually see in oncology studies. Um, so the magnitude of benefit is, I think, sufficient by itself to warrant uh, thinking about this drug in first line uh, in the appropriate patients. Um, we will, of course, be getting uh, further data in, uh, in regard to survival, but we already have some preliminary survival data which indicates that the curves have split in favor of osimertinib. Uh, the p-value looks quite robust, but it, it, it has to meet a, a very high bar of statistical significance because of uh, serial analyses, uh, I think. Uh, but it does look that the survival is probably going to be in favor uh, of osimertinib, but um, uh, that will come out, I would anticipate, within the next six to nine months. Uh, but it is certainly not inferior. I think we can say that for sure on the osimertinib compared to the standard of care. Um, so we have a very strong and robust progression-free survival, uh, good toxicity, and survival curves that seem to be splitting in the right direction. Uh, so I think all of this is uh, very optimistic, and uh, this package so far for me would be sufficient to prescribe it in first line. So the control arm uh, used uh, either... Uh, Erlotinib or gefitinib based on dealer's choice, um, and I think we haven't seen the side effects of that broken down in detail, but in general I think all of us are very familiar with the side effect profile of both of those drugs. Um, what we have in the study is pooled toxicity data from uh, the control arm, which as I say would be either of those two drugs. And looking at the osimertinib, the toxicity for skin and for liver enzyme abnormalities uh, and for discontinuations due to adverse events is less on the osimertinib. Um, I think it's a mistake to say the drug has zero toxicity. Um, it does have a little bit of skin toxicity. There's a bit of diarrhea, a um, little bit of stomatitis, the odd paronychia, but um, this is a, a typical EGFR type pattern, but it seems to be less so than in the alternatives. Uh, and so I would say overall, it appears to be safe. The uh, toxicity that we're most concerned about is pneumonitis. It doesn't seem to be an issue with this drug in particular. Um, and remarkably, or, although this drug is known to cross into the CNS uh, with, fairly high, uh, with fairly high concentrations, there does not appear to be a CNS side effect that's concerning. So that's another bonus, that this drug uh, is probably effective in people with CNS metastases and probably in preventing CNS metastases from appearing. And so that's another benefit here. So I think overall the package is really quite attractive. Yes, I, I would um, think that we've uh, got enough information to, to warrant that now. Um, as I say, uh, we'll be getting more information about the definitive survival uh, over the next six months, nine months, one year, it's hard to say. Uh, but I think there's enough information now for me to feel comfortable in prescribing this as the treatment of choice uh, in first line. And uh, I have been happy prescribing it in second line for quite some time based on the T790M biomarker, which is not a requirement for first line. Uh, so for patients with the common mutations, the lesion 19 exon 21, uh, I would feel comfortable prescribing this drug.
I think we have to think about um, the patient as a whole and not just uh, about the crude parameters such as progression-free survival and uh, overall survival. Um, we know that some patients will cross over from, say, first line or first generation EGFR TKIs to osimertinib in the second line. That's also a, a possible scenario. Uh, but that will, in general, only apply to some of these patients who have proven T790M mutations. It's really difficult to get a, a second biopsy in many of these people. They simply can't get it or will refuse or the uh, facilities uh, are not there to do it in a timely fashion. We do have the serum test, uh, which is a help, but is not 100% sensitive, so we're going to be missing some patients that way. And so uh, I think it's unfortunately the case that a lot of the people in second line who should get it uh, will not, in fact, get it for these various reasons. And for that reason, it's probably better to offer this drug in first line uh, to everybody, at least with deletion 19 and exon 21, so that we can suppress the development of the T790 mutation. Um, which would otherwise happen in about 60% of them. And secondly, that it will get into the brain and preserve the brain, uh, either in those who already have brain metastases, uh, and they may not necessarily need to be radiated, as they might have been in the past, because this drug has such good penetration, or even in those people who don't have CNS metastases, but who might develop them or might have developed them on first-generation TKI, uh, we can suppress that, I think, uh, to a greater degree of efficiency with this drug and preventing overt brain metastases and letting people be who they are for longer because we know how devastating it can be if there's um, a major brain failure uh, in these patients with uh, brain relapse and, and macroscopic disease and radiation and the uh, memory loss and dementia that can occur. And bear in mind that these patients may have fairly long survival if they have whole brain radiation, they may live for some time with impaired memory and impaired, impaired personality and, and not the kind of people who they normally are. But this drug seems to have the, the possibility of keeping people, uh, keeping people functionally who they are, keeping their CNS clear for substantially longer than would otherwise be the case. And I think this is an enormous consideration in terms of quality of life, not just quantity.